My name is Tom Unterena and I am the elected chair of the campaign for nuclear disarmament. I've been active in CND and anti-war and peace causes for all of my adult life and I currently work for the Bertrand Russell Peace Foundation where I co-edit a journal called The Spokesman. CND nowadays, it's one of those organisations that's in the 80s and 90s was very big. Uh, for, for many people, it sort of disappeared over the horizon. I think that might well be the case. But in the 1990s and into the 2000s, it almost appeared as if the nuclear threat had disappeared. The, we had the end of the Cold War. We had the end of this great power rivalry between the United States and the then Soviet Union. And it's true to say that a lot of the really acute nuclear tensions did abate somewhat. They never completely disappeared, but those big headline risks and headline tensions did disappear. But we're now faced with a situation where nuclear risks are posed more sharply. This is the reality, they're posed more sharply now and they have been at any time since the opening of the atomic age in 1945. Why is that? I mean, we keep hearing about this. I mean, like every now and again, you get a little message about the uh, doomsday clock. Uh, so how come the uh, relative safety from nuclear war <coughs> in the 1990s uh, has gone? There are a number of reasons for this, one being the fact that what was understood widely to be the nuclear order, these treaties, these agreements, these uh, plans that were in place, which were supposed to regulate the nuclear world, whether it's the non-proliferation treaty, which is one of the last treaties standing, to something called the INF or the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, to something called commonly the Iran deal, but otherwise known as the JCPOA. A whole number of these treaties have been sabotaged or attacked or undermined. And that was most clearly the case during the first and hopefully the only, in my view, Trump presidency, where he withdrew unilaterally from this INF treaty, which banned the placement of a whole range of nuclear weapons in mainland Europe. And that opened the real prospect of such we weapons or weapons of a similar character being stationed in Europe again. So there's that. The infrastructure which was supposed to regulate and to make us all safer has been steadily undermined. But it's also the case that the world on a, is shifting globally. Power is shifting. The economy is shifting. And the United States is in a situation where for decades it has been the sole great power on the planet uh, on the planet it's now faced with a situation where there are other rising centers of power where there are other rising economies and i'm afraid that their reaction to this has been to increase militarism increase saber rattling in an effort to either halt this changing world or to undermine it completely. And my belief is, and CND's belief, is that this process is one of the big drivers towards the, the nuclear tensions we see now. What about uh, this rally that's coming up on the Saturday, the 2nd of November at Lake and Heath? Um, can you just tell us uh, why, uh, why it's necessary, why you feel it's necessary? Well, this is a, a key example of the thing I've just spoken about. In the late 2000s, the United States finally withdrew its nuclear bombs from the, the Lake and Heath Air Base in Suffolk. It's about halfway between Cambridge and Norwich. And they withdrew them after a very long campaign, including CND, including local groups and many others indeed. So this was a an American nuclear base in Britain, American personnel, American aircraft, American bombs. That, that all went in the late 2000s. But just two years ago, it was revealed that the United States had plans to upgrade again their storage facilities at this base. Now, these storage facilities are there for one purpose, to hold US nuclear bombs. Across Europe, in Germany, in Belgium, the Netherlands, two places in Italy, there have always been, during this period, US nuclear facilities. The bombs were 
placed in these European bases on something called a nuclear sharing basis. But what's happening at Lake and Heath is something different. This is the direct expansion of America's nuclear presence into Europe, onto the Lake and Heath Air Base once again. And they have already deployed a new generation of nuclear capable jets, the F-35As with enhanced technologies, with enhanced operability. And it looks almost certain to us now that once more nuclear weapons from the United States will be stationed there. And these just aren't any old nuclear bomb. These are bombs dropped from planes. These will not be missiles. But this is the latest generation of bomb technology, which includes a steerability function so it can be guided more accurately, which includes something called a dialable threshold for use, which means it can range from something just a couple of times, well, not just a couple of times more powerful than the bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, up to a very powerful weapon indeed. And in the context of US presidents talking about usable nuclear weapons, talking about the need to put nuclear threats at the heart of what they call their security, all this amounts to putting Britain, not just the Lake and Heath Air Base and its surrounding area, but the entire country on the nuclear front line once again. And we're protesting this. We don't want US nuclear bombs to return to Lake and Heath. And to make matters worse, to make matters worse, this whole thing, this whole process and plan has been carried out without any proper debate in the British Parliament, without any opportunity for questions or deliberations, without any opportunity for our elected representatives to examine the fine detail of what's going on, let alone an opportunity for them to outrightly object. And I think very many of them would, like us, see the real dangers in this plan if it is to go ahead and to be completed. So we're there to raise the alarm, to make sure as many people as possible know what is going on, to make it clear that this is part of a globally increased nuclear risk profile and to say, stop it, take a step back, do not expand the US nuclear blueprint into the UK once more. And let's talk about a real discussion about security instead. Surely with weapons like this, um, I'm, I'm amazed that we even know what's going on. Surely they, they don't want to tell anybody whereabouts their nuclear weapons are. <laughs> well, no, they certainly don't. Um, and when questioned and when asked, so British officials, ministers and others have said we do not comment on this question. The only reason that we were first alerted to this development is because there are people who pay very close attention, researchers who pay very close attention to United States Department of Defense budgets. And it was in a footnote of one such budget, which in the previous year had listed the European, mainland European nuclear, US nuclear bases and facilities. And that went from just listing Belgium, the Netherlands, Germany, Italy, and Turkey, in fact, from one year to the next, the UK was added. And we know that there is now extensive building work going on at Lake and Heath. We know, because they've advertised it themselves, that the nuclear capable new generation of F-35s are already there. But when it comes to actually telling the truth about and being transparent about the stationing of these nuclear weapons, we have no comment. And that is really very dangerous for a country that calls itself a democracy. Everybody has the right to full access to information about what is being done in their name, especially when it's being done by a country in which we cannot vote, the United States, when they're coming to ostensibly British air bases. In fact, Lake and Heath is a US air base. Um, but when they're deciding to station these potentially deadly weapons here again, it just simply makes common sense that there should be some opportunity for questions to be asked at the very least. But we don't even have that. And that's why we are will be protesting again on the 2nd of November. Yeah, back in uh, the 1980s, there was a big hoo-ha about crews uh, with hundreds of thousands of people involved. Of course, the main problem is 
that uh, th these weapons then make all of that whole local area a, a massive target for incoming nuclear weapons. Um, maybe local people should be informed that that that, uh, that there is a target next door to them. Uh, I know it's not totally your area, Tom, but um, it, it, it sounds amazing to me. A lot of these bases, they have on the front door, they have RAF. In fact, even on the map, it says an RAF station. What, what's the extent of the U.S. presence over here? Well, I can. Uh, the U.S. bootprint on the United Kingdom remains extensive, whether it's joint operations from um, the Bude base, which is a monitoring and intelligence gathering facility, i.e. a spy base, not all that far from Bristol on the north, north of, uh, on the north Cornish coast through to very large facilities like Crowton, which is another intelligence gathering um, facility. There are air bases across the country which are in constant use by US facilities where, you know, there are bases located in the south of England, in Oxfordshire in particular, which are the only places in the vicinity, i.e. in Europe, which have long enough runways to take certain types of nuclear capable US bomber aircraft all the way to what they call RAF Lake and Heath. Now I can tell you the reality of what's going on at Lake and Heath and similar bases because on the road at Lake and Heath just before you get to the gates there is a thick white line. On one side of that white line will stand British police officers and potentially British armed personnel. On the other side of that white line you're in US territory where there are armed US personnel, where US laws pertain, where the US is in charge. And behind that white line, you have US nuclear capable aircraft. And we believe very soon they will put US nuclear bombs once again. And there are a whole series of agreements between the British and American governments that govern and regulate the military relationship. They're not keen on talking about them and they're not keen on scrutiny, but it's very, very important we do scrutinise. Another example of this is something called the Mutual Defence Agreement, first signed by between the United States and the United Kingdom decades ago. This agreement regulates the nuclear re relationship between the US and the UK. Every 14 years or so, certainly it was 14 years on a regular basis up until today, that agreement, that treaty had to be put before Parliament for renewal. For parliamentarians to continue to agree to maintain this very close military nuclear relationship. It's before Parliament again, but we fear it will be before Parliament for the very last time, because the latest amendment, to the Mutual Defence Agreement, removes any need, any need whatsoever for a review process. It'll be a permanent military nuclear treaty between the UK and the US, which parliamentarians, let alone the public, will not be able to scrutinise. So CND is asking everybody out there to contact their member of parliament and ask them to support something called early day motion one, two, three, which calls for a proper and full debate on the mutual defence agreement and for a removal of this clause which now states that it will exist in perpetuity without the opportunity for scrutiny. It's a very serious issue for democracy and transparency and it needs to be addressed. Now we're looking at a bit of a new cold war at the moment uh, and a lot of commentators are pointing towards Russia and they're pointing towards Putin as brandishing uh, his nuclear weapons. Surely you know we need to do something in response to that. President Putin's actions and his statements around nuclear weapons have been steadily and explicitly opposed by CND. CND is opposed to all nuclear weapons everywhere. And certainly the statements that have come from Putin himself and from other Russian officials are incredibly alarming indeed. And they should stop. They should halt. But what's less reported in the UK media is the overall context for these things. Yes, we know about the horrors and the meat grinding war in Ukraine. And again, CND, along with other organisations, calls for an end to this war and calls for Russia to 
withdraw. But as I've spoken previously about the presence of US nuclear weapons in Europe. I've spoken about the fact that they're in Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, Belgium, and indeed in Turkey. What's far less frequently mentioned is that the nuclear blueprint is expanding and there are other states, including states neighboring Russia, which are positively lobbying for the presence of nuclear, US nuclear capabilities in their own countries. And so the idea that you respond to reckless and potentially dangerous nuclear threats by simply upping the ante and escalating yourself only leads in one direction. Now, we're told that nuclear weapons are the fundamental guarantor of security in this country and for other NATO member states. That's what they tell us. We have to assume that's what they believe. But take a step back from that. What does that actually mean? It means that our fundamental security rests on the idea that our government, in our name, will unleash mass death, mega death, death and destruction, not just across Europe, but potentially across the world. Now, I'm not sure about your listeners or you, but I think that if we use plain language, if our politicians use plain language to describe how they think they're making us safer and more secure, if they spoke in honest terms about what they actually mean when they say nuclear weapons make us safe, then I think more and more people start to question and would start to demand answers and would demand, even more of us would start to demand the abolition of nuclear weapons once and for all. Because if you think you can make a place secure and safe by threatening genocide, then you need to think again. And our government certainly needs to think again. Ironic, isn't it, that uh, it was Iran, actually, the Islamic Republic that issued a fatwa against nuclear weapons, saying these things are morally reprehensible. Now, it's difficult to know whether they've actually got any or not, but that at least is a moral position. Oh, we know that Iran does not have nuclear weapons. We know because despite the fact that the Trump administration did its best to destroy the Iran deal, which regulated um, Iran's nuclear status, there are still officials in Iran from something called the International Atomic Energy um, Association. It's a United Nations body. They carry out regular inspections in Iran um, across a number of facilities and a number of places, remembering that Iran is a very large country. And they report that although Iran is steadily increasing the degree to which it is enriching uranium, and this is an essential process for making a nuclear warhead, they have not yet reached the point where they have sufficiently enriched material to make such a weapon, and not even in the quantities that would make such a weapon achievable. And even if Iran did manage to enrich uranium to the required level, there's a very big difference between having enriched uranium and having a bomb, a workable bomb to put it on, and indeed a workable delivery system. So a lot of the noise that we have coming um, from various quarters about the status of Iran, Iran and its nuclear capabilities um, needs to seriously address the practicalities and the facts about what is going on. But we hear a lot about Iran's nuclear capabilities. We hear very little about the fact that there is only one nuclear armed state in the Middle East, and that is Israel. Um, Israel has been a nuclear armed state, a nuclear capable state for some time now. But unlike the rest of the world, including at times even North Korea, including um, Russia and including the other declared nuclear powers, Israel has never never engaged with these international treaties. There's never been a single independent inspection from the IAEA or anybody else over Israel's nuclear capabilities. And if there's one country in the region that has the capability to unleash nuclear war, it isn't Iran, it is Israel, which makes the situation there currently all the more alarming. It certainly does. I mean, they're starting to look like a nuclear armed doomsday cult, for goodness sake. But look, um, we, we haven't mentioned Britain's nuclear weapons, uh, the Trident. 
this is an American system. And I, I wonder if you can just uh, put our listeners straight on whether it is really an independent system. Because we keep hearing about these missiles uh, that the NATO countries are sending over to the Ukrainians and that they have to send their own personnel to operate them. I wonder whether the Brits, if they wanted uh, to uh, uh, nu- nuke uh, using a Trident weapon, a country that was the Americans didn't want them to, how independent is Trident, really? Well, first of all, in terms of the construction and the constitution of the Trident system itself, it is wholly reliant on United States technologies, assistance and support. And that goes from the design of the missiles which are carried upon the Trident uh, cap- uh, nuclear capable submarines, all the way down to the guidance systems themselves. These are based on American designs. And you know, when our governments of whatever disposition talk about Britain's, this is the phrase they use, Britain's independent nuclear deterrence, they're trying to con us. It is not independent. It is not independent at all. You know, this is a country that can't even build a high-speed rail conne- rail connection, um, HS2. You know, the idea that it can maintain a highly sophisticated uh, system like a, a nuclear capability is for the birds. It is not independent and it is not a deterrent at all. It's a tool of compellence. And it's not clear it is not clear that if a British Prime Minister wanted to fire a nuclear missile, that they could do so without the express permission or at least consent of the United States. So that is something to make us all think, especially given the dynamics of American politics at the moment. We should all think very seriously about those implications. OK, so what's happening at Lake and Heath then and how can people go along if they want? Well, there is an ongoing presence at Lake and Heath. On a regular basis, there are people from an organisation called the Lake and Heath Alliance for Peace, which CMD is part of. This is composed of local people and people from across the country who are maintaining an ongoing presence to highlight what is happening there. And every weekend there are things happening at Lake and Heath. Every, the last Saturday of every month, there is a larger presence at Lake and Heath. There have been peace camps there, so like we had in the 1980s with people camping out. And I would encourage anybody who wants to get involved in that sort of activity to find the Lake and Heath Alliance for Peace online and to get themselves there. But on the 2nd of November in particular, we will have a national demonstration. So we'll have people coming from across the country and further afield, actually, to protest at the gates of Lake and Heath. Everybody is welcome to attend. Anybody within striking distance of London can get on CND coaches from London to Lake and Heath. Anybody with access to train travel and the ability to travel like that. There's a train station very close by, Brandon train station. There will be transport going from Cambridge and Norwich as well. And I know that people will be coming from across the country from as far away as St. 